is Matthew Wayne Selznick. And this is Sonatotem, episode 92. Hello, my friends. On this and every episode of Sonatotem, we talk about making stuff, mostly writing, finding success as we each define it for ourselves, and staying healthy and sane in the process. Who am I to be talking about such things? Well, I'm a creator. I've been a writer and a musician and a podcaster and whatever else strikes my fancy when it comes to making things for, well, a very long time. (laughs) And uh, I also uh, help other creators bring their works to fruition and to market and to an audience. I started making things, well, I mean when I was five years old, right? But really making things for other people since the late 1980s with punk rock bands and print literary zines. And in the 90s, I created what was among the first actual webzines, a periodical that existed only on the web. In uh, 2004, I was the 41st podcaster ever. In 2005, I was an early pioneer of independent publishing. And I was the, mm, I was in the first two dozen of the pioneering group to podcast a novel. And in fact, that novel, Brave Men Run, was the first book in history with a simultaneous initial release in paperback, five different ebook formats, if you can believe that, and free podcast editions. I have served as a creative producer on marketing campaigns for major motion pictures, television shows. I'm a songwriter with well over 200 original songs. I make things. It's what I do. And I help other people make their things. I work with other authors and writers, published or not. I work with artists. Sometimes I work with actors and folks who work in in tangible arts and crafts. I make things for people who like the kinds of things that I make, and I help you make things and help you find the people who will like the things that you make. This was originally to be uh, an interview episode. See, every two weeks, Sonatotem comes out, and typically, each episode includes a conversation with usually a writer of some kind, talking about uh, how they make stuff and why they make stuff and how they define success and how they stay healthy and sane in the process. But uh, today, oh, by the way, it's uh, as I record this with you today, it is uh, Sunday, August 6th, 2023. I'm coming to you from the lush and lavish and rather sticky and humid studios of MWS Media in Huntington Beach, California. Maybe you can hear birds chirping outside. I've got the window open because, yeah, it's muggy and hot and I don't want to be uh, <laughs> I don't want to be closed in the room while I talk to you. As I was getting ready to produce the already recorded conversation that I had ready to go today, I decided I wanted to talk about something else because it's been going on with me and I want to talk to you about it. So I identify as an introvert. 
I think I always have been, but it's only been in the last few years that I've, I've truly kind of embraced that aspect of my personality, that aspect of my, my neurochemistry, really. And just to define some things, for those of you who, who, who might not be aware, because introvert is one of those colloquialisms that people throw around to mean a certain thing. And, you know, you might not really get it because maybe you're not actually, you know, maybe you're not an introvert or you've just heard the sort of, well, again, colloquial use of the word to mean someone who's kind of shy or someone who kind of likes to keep to themselves or someone who, uh, you know, doesn't uh, have a very big social circle or uh, someone who uh, gets more enjoyment from being with themselves than other people. Well, none of those things are completely exactly right. And before I go on, I'm not attempting to blanket define what every introvert's experience is. But I think it's important to understand that to be an introvert, it doesn't mean that you're antisocial or shy. It means, well, I'll speak for myself. I have always enjoyed my own company. As a child, I could spend hours in the confines of my bedroom, creating elaborate dramas <laughs> with action figures and toy soldiers. And <laughs> I, would, I would carry on days-long campaigns, rubber band wars, yes, rubber band wars, between different factions. You know, I would have my extensive collection of dinosaurs and... Uh, uh, maybe toy soldiers and things like that on one side of the room. And on the other side of the room might be uh, action figures or something like that. Micronauts. You can look those up. And I would, uh, I would shoot at them with rubber bands, you know, from one side of the room to the other. But while this was going on, while this battle was happening, there was an ongoing story being told out loud, I imagine that <laughs> I, I never asked her, but I can imagine that my mother might have spent time just outside my closed door, just listening in to the uh, improvised and ever unfolding drama that I was uh, that I was enacting. <laughs> I hope that she did. I hope that she got a big kick out of that. But speaking of her, she would have to insist. She would have to pretty much kick me out of the house. Go outside and play. Go call your friends. Go hang out with somebody. Get out of the house for a while. And I'm grateful that she did. But I always knew that I didn't necessarily need to. I got great, great energy from the, the engine of my own creativity. Last episode, I referred to that, uh, that state of pure creativity for creativity's sake as the only place where I really felt like I was home. And that's, that's yeah, yeah. What does that have to do with being an introvert? Well, it's not that I don't enjoy being around people. It's that I most enjoy being around some people <laughs> some of the time. It's not that I don't do well in crowds or uh, in social situations. It's that I need some time to uh, recharge away from social situations or interactions with others after I've had it. It's complex. It's not simple. And it's hard for some people in my life to understand. Because it doesn't matter how much I care about you. It doesn't matter 
how much I love you. It doesn't matter if we're in a relationship or what. This need for solitude, this need to be away from the stimulus of other people in order to stay acquainted with my own thoughts, with my own self, with my, yes, my creativity. That is, uh, doesn't, that doesn't, uh, there's no exceptions. <laughs> and I didn't always know this. And it led to, uh, I mean, it still leads to what I thought was social anxiety. Like I would, I would have plans to go do something. And then the day of, I would just, mm. no, I really don't want to. I'd really rather not. <laughs> and I would feel guilty about that. But now that I've realized that it is just me that I need uh, solitude to truly be myself and to truly be my best possible self for and with the people I care about. I, I mean, I won't say it's made life easier, but I will say that at least I understand what's going on. All of this is to say that I'm in the middle of... Uh, what will amount to about mm, 16 days of at least physical solitude. And it's taken me about a week and a day to truly feel like I'm not like recovering. But it was only yesterday that I really started to feel kind of, sort of like, like I was me. Now, what does this all have to do with, with, with creativity, with why I wanted to talk to you today? Well, related to all of this is the sense that when my head is filled up with other people's concerns, other people's thoughts, other people's input, other people's lives, too long and for too much, there's not much room for anything else for me. I need the mental and physical and situational. I need the solitude in every sense of the word. I need to be alone. <laughs> it doesn't mean I'm lonely, although it might. That's part of the experience. And that's not something to be shunned, by the way. That's something to be felt and embraced. But... I need to be alone regularly and for extended periods of time to sort of clear the plate. And so the first week or so that, uh, that I've been on my own here in the house, pretty much all I did was, was, I mean, other than work for my clients was catch up on cheesy TV shows that are not so guilty pleasures of mine. Finally finished watching the last season of The Flash, and I caught up on on uh, um, Superman and Lois, and I'm catching up on uh, Star Trek: Strange New Worlds, and just good fun stuff. And I've been existing at a different schedule, where. Well, I don't have to be regimented according to the rhythms of the rhythms that just emerge when you're living full time with someone else, getting up kind of the same time every day and getting to work at the same time every day. And this part is work and then there is lunch and then there is dinner and this part is, is not work and socializing with your, your partner or what have you. I might work for a little while and then I might watch a thing and then I might work on something creative and I'm going to get to that. Believe me, I am getting to it. And then I might work some more and then I might eat dinner and then I might watch a thing or watch the thing while I'm eating dinner. And then I might, uh, you know, do some chores and then I might go back to work on client stuff and then I might work on some of my stuff and then I might go to bed. And <laughs> It's so much more free form and it's, it's following where my energy is. 
and following whim, not at the expense of responsibility. In fact, as I get into this rhythm of my solitude, I've felt more like myself. And that has led me to want to create. And it's been so long, as regular listeners to this podcast know, it's been so long since I've been in an actively creating mode that I've been getting reacquainted with things. I've been going through and reviewing and rereading the 80-odd, so far, installments of Hazy Days and Cloudy Nights, how it all got started, the free serial that I offered to my mailing list community subscribers. When you join the mailing list community, which is free, over there at mattselznick.com, part of what you get is these weekly installments of Hazy Days and Cloudy Nights, how it all got started, which is a... Uh, Whenever you start your subscription, whenever you sign up to become a member of the community, you start at installment number one of Hazy Days and Cloudy Nights. And as I said, there's 80 and counting installments. So that's a lot of free fiction. Hazy Days and Cloudy Nights is part of my sovereign era story world. That first book I mentioned that I wrote back in 2005, uh, it's part of the sovereign era too. It's called Brave Men Run, and it's kind of a, well, it's a mid-80s alternate history where at the height of the Cold War, it's discovered that people with, for want of a better word, superpowers exist, and, you know, things happen. Hazy Days and Cloudy Nights takes place about a year before that and features a bunch of people who are secondary and tertiary characters in Brave Men Run. They take center stage. And look, I'll be honest, it's a uh, it's kind of a teen drama <laughs> in prose form. So, you know, if you enjoyed speaking of not so guilty pleasures, if you enjoyed things like Dawson's Creek or uh, you know, One Tree Hill or John Hughes mo movies from the 80s, especially, then Hazy Days and Cloudy Nights is fun. And it, it, it's part of Sovereign Era uh, canon. Anyway, I've been getting reacquainted with it. And I've been getting excited about creating new installments. And I've been dipping into the world building of my Shaper's World story world. The Shaper's World story world so far includes the novel Light of the Outsider and the follow-up novelette, The Perfumed Air at Kiwanantag Bay. So those are the last two pieces of fiction I wrote, and I've been struggling to write the second novel, Shadow of the Outsider, for uh, over a year now, friends. And there just hasn't been room in my head. <laughs> so right now... Yeah, I'm getting into the world building, and I'm not even really focusing on trying to write manuscript pages. I'm getting back into the world. This setting of the Shaper's world, the, the, the planet, the continent, the countries, the environments. I have been feeling nudged toward going back and, for maybe the third time, starting a, uh, a short story in my Daikaiju Universe story world called Reggie versus... What is the name of the thing? <laughs> I don't remember. Point is, I've been feeling like I want... I can write it again. And while there is a very slight nagging sense that, well, you better get on that, Matt, because in a week you're going to have to go back to the normal routine of things, and this might slip away. I'm really mainly trying to focus on just doing what feels good creatively. The phrase that's been coming to me 
a lot. And it's the title of this episode. Is that I'm cleaning my brushes. I'm doing the things with my creative tools that put me in touch with them and also prepare them for use. You know, after and before you start a painting, well, you've got to clean your brushes. You've got to make sure that all the old paint, all the detritus, right, has been cleared away and that they're clean and fresh and and ready to be used. You've got to trim the nibs on your pens. Is that the word? Nib? <laughs> Sharpen your quill. Stretch your canvases. Whatever it might be. Now, I work mostly in words and in thoughts. So I'm playing around with the things in my head and I'm, I'm, I'm playing with the pieces. I'm playing with my blocks and I'm feeling how they feel in my hands. Some memories are coming to me right now. When I, when I was uh, maybe in kindergarten or first grade and we were doing painting, right? Watercolors, almost certainly. I remember the teacher very specifically. We all brought coffee cans into class and a little bit of turpentine was poured into those coffee cans and we were told how to clean our our brushes and i will never forget this the teacher had a little song that went along with cleaning our brushes and she would take the brush and she would put it in the turpentine and she would say do a little dance at the bottom of the can <laughs> <laughs> what uh you know 50 years later i still remember do a little dance at the bottom of the can <laughs> i'm doing that dance friends i'm doing that dance dear listeners i am cleaning my brushes i am playing with my blocks i'm 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 looking at the stuff the things that make up what i do and if that's if that's creativity for now, then then well, you know, I was gonna say so be it, but you know what? No, there's there's no um that's it. That's that's just it. That's creativity right now. When I finish recording this podcast, I'm gonna play around with the <laughs> technical parts, the geophysical and astrophysical and cartographical aspects of the shaper's world. Because by building maps, it sparks my imagination. A map is a symbol of the territory, and I need to get back to the territory. And by creating the maps, and yeah, this sounds metaphorical, and sure, it is, but I'm being literal as well. By creating the maps, I immerse myself in the territory and I'm really looking forward to it. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be spending a good part of my day today, Sunday, doing just that. I mean, it's 2.40 right now in the afternoon and I could go until I drop and that's a great feeling. So I don't know. I felt like sharing this with you because it's possible. As creators yourself, probably as writers yourself, maybe you also feel that friction of finding a way back home and also staying in the world. Home being your creative heart, your, your, your creative oasis. The place where you are you doing what you are perfectly suited, <laughs> driven to do. The balance between that and existing in the world 
with your responsibilities and the people that you love and the people who, yeah, need you and um, all of that. And yeah, there's always going to be something, especially as we all grow older. There's always going to be something to pull you away from the oasis of your true self, the, 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 the core, the heart of your heart, your creativity. And I guess all I'm saying is, and as always, this is a reminder to myself and also maybe, hopefully, a little bit of wisdom and help for you. All I'm saying is when you have the chance, don't feel like, okay, I've got this space to be creative. I must produce something right away. I've got to make the most of this time because that's what I always do. It's okay. It's necessary to first clean your brushes. Take out your toys. Look at them. Set up your blocks. Feel them in your hands. Spread out the cards. Sharpen the pencils. Explore. Get reacquainted. Immerse yourself in the things that you have made, that you are making. Don't worry so much about finishing something right away in these little, little, little pockets of time that you might get. Play with your gifts. And yeah, if you can play with your gifts every day, as it says on the little mug that I made, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes just in case you want to have that mug to look at every day. Play with your gifts every day if you can in some way. But when you get the chance, when you get these, these moments, these days, if you're lucky, these weeks, if you're luckier, of ideal creative time, whatever that means for you, for me, it's solitude and, 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 and being able to, to exist at my own rhythm whatever it means for you, if you're lucky enough to get those stretches, don't feel the pressure of, of accomplishing something before those pockets. We're going to mix metaphors now. Before those pockets get burst. <laughs> don't feel the pressure to complete something. Let your creativity be what it's going to be. If you're a writer, an author, like I am primarily, and all you do in that space of time is sort of free write on character backstories or the history of your world, or you just do pieces of an outline, or you, you just write and it doesn't necessarily fit anywhere. Whatever it is, just play. All of it is cleaning your brushes. All of it is removing the detritus, the crud <laughs> that calcifies over your creative heart, that accretes from the distractions of your everyday life. All of it is helping to wash that away. Use the time. Don't feel the pressure of the time. Be in it. I think that's what I wanted to share with you. I think that's what I wanted to tell myself. I hope that's useful. Can I talk to you a little bit about uh, the show, about Sonatotem itself? A month or so back, I decided that I was moving to a, a bi-weekly, every two weeks schedule, rather than a weekly schedule. Back when the show was weekly... I would switch. One week would be a solo episode like this one, and the next week would be uh, one of the conversations that I have with other writers and creators. Those conversation episodes take a long, long time, 10, 12, 13 hours to produce. And it was killing me. <laughs> it was leaving no room. It was becoming a burden. It was becoming exhausting to do. 
And that's why I went to bi-weekly and I eliminated these solo episodes. But, you know, here I am, uh, bumping back an interview show in order to do this solo episode because this is, this is my outlet, my, my way to speak to you. Anyway, since I've gone to the bi-weekly schedule, since I've been only, mostly, doing interview shows, I'm afraid the show is going backwards in popularity and in reach. In the last 30 days, there have been 31% fewer downloads than the previous 30 days, and 41% fewer listeners. And let me tell you, not a whole lot of people listen to each episode to begin with. I mean, we're talking just a few dozen. So, it's a lot of people who've gone away. And I'm not sure if they've gone away because I'm not doing these solo episodes as much. I'm not sure if they're going away because the interview subjects have not been people that they're interested in hearing. I don't know. I'm not sure if it's simply because of the every two weeks and they missed the memo that the show had gone to every two weeks. And so, just unsubscribed. I don't know where the folks who have left have gone. And because they've left, I'm not asking them to tell me because, hey, they're not here. <laughs> but what I am doing is talking to you, the person who is listening. And I'm glad you're here. And if you are here, you're probably here for content like this. And I hope for content like the conversations that I have with other authors and writers. So you're listening right now. I'm talking to you. Please make sure, if you're not already a multiversalist patron, and I'll get into that in a second, please make sure you're subscribed. Wherever it is that you get your podcasts, just make sure that you hit that subscribe button in the podcast app, probably, that you're using on your phone. Maybe it's Apple Podcasts. Maybe it's Podcast Addict for Android. That's my favorite. Or Stitcher, but I hear Stitcher is going away. So, by the way, if Stitcher it was your podcast app of choice and you're on an Android, um, consider Podcast Addict. It's pretty fucking cool, and it even has streaming radio built in as well, uh, which I've recently discovered. <laughs> anyway, please subscribe to Sonatotem with Matthew Wayne Selznick, wherever it is you get your podcasts, so that you don't have to think about it. You just... Get a new episode every time it goes out into the world. If you know people who appreciate what you appreciate about this show, which I assume is very in-depth, evergreen conversations with other writers and authors, and every now and again, personal, transparent, vulnerable, and I hope in some way actionable, real talk <laughs> from another creative writer to you. In fact, I'm going to go out on a limb and declare that Sonatotem is the most vulnerable, transparent, and personal podcast about writing that you're going to find. You appreciate that because you're listening. You probably know other people who would appreciate it too. Please share Sonatotem with them through probably your social media, right? Wherever it is that you talk to people about stuff. Maybe it's a Discord group or a YouTube channel. Maybe you've, you know, I don't know, whatever it is, however you reach your people, let them know about Sonatotem, please. And let them know they can subscribe to Sonatotem anywhere they get their podcasts. Or of course, they can just go right to mattselznick.com click on the podcast link and find it there. And the usual, right? Please consider rating and reviewing the podcast wherever it is you listen to Sonatotem. Rating and reviewing, you know this, you listen to podcasts and you've probably heard me say this before. Rating and reviewing, it takes a minute or two of your time and it helps raise the, the visibility of Sonatotem in the podcast directories so that when people are looking for writing podcasts, there's more of a chance that they might see Sonatotem, discover that it exists, listen to it and subscribe and our community 
Gross. The show as it stands now is, <laughs> at least in terms of listeners and downloads and subscribers, the show is backsliding. So you can help turn that around. I hope you will. If you would like to support the show in a more tangible, let's be frank, monetary way and get some perks in return, you could become a multiversalist patron. My multiversalists community, they pledge $5 a month through Patreon. And in return, they get the uncut, unedited version of every episode of the podcast. They get sneak peeks into my works in progress. And they get every single thing that I release digitally or electronically for the duration of their patronage. There's also a Discord community. And things that I just I try to do for my multiversalists when and if I can. I want to thank my existing multiversalist patrons, and there's a place, there's an area where support for the show is growing. So thank you to my multiversalist patrons, folks who've been around for a while, like Chuck Anderson, Amy Bowen, J.C. Hutchins, and Ted Leonhardt, and folks who have recently either become or upgraded to the multiversalist $5 a month level, Jim Lewinson and Pearl Zare. Thank you so much to my multiversalists. If you would like to become a multiversalist patron, go to mattselznick.com slash b a patron. There is a seven-day free trial, so you can dip in and see what you think. And then after that, it's $5 a month. When you go to mattselznick.com slash b-a-patron, you'll see all of the things that multiversalists receive. You'll get to see uh, pictures of, well, all but uh, all but one of the patrons. I'm still waiting for Jim Lewinson. Hi, Jim, to uh, send me... A picture so I can put that up on the website if you want. Anyway, the idea behind the multiversalists community is that we become a community, that we become mutually supportive. It's small but mighty, and it does help offset the time and energy and effort that goes into creating every one of these episodes of Sonatotum. Especially the incredibly uh, intense work that goes into creating the interview episodes. If you have thoughts on this or any other episode of Sonatotum, I hope you will consider leaving a comment in the show notes for this episode, mattselznick.com slash sonatotum-092. That's M-A-T-T-S-E-L-Z. N I C K dot com slash S O N I T O T U M dash zero nine two Matt Selznick dot com slash sonatotum dash zero nine two. Leave a comment there, or perhaps more simply, you can send an email to Matt at Matt Selznick dot com or record a brief voice message on your phone and email. Email that to me at matt at mattselznick.com. How do you get back to your creative heart? And do you feel the freedom to just play with your gifts when you're there? Tell me about it. Tell me what you do to, to handle the friction, the struggle between existing in your creative heart and existing in the world. <laughs> Whatever that means for you. Explaining it to me might help clarify it for yourself and it might resonate with other listeners. 
So consider leaving your feedback. Thanks for listening. My name is Matthew Wayne Selznick. Take care. Thank you.